Throughout this season, we have seen a lot of teams struggle, whether it's financially or on the pitch, or even both. But one club that I have not seen a single person talk about yet is Sampdoria. So we're gonna do that today. Before we get into this video though, a quick shout out to a fellow patron of the channel, Jonah. If you're looking for a podcast about F1 in either English or French, follow the JJF1 podcast on Instagram. The handle is on the screen here and also will be linked in the description. To talk about Sampdoria's history, we'll have to go all the way back to 1891 when there were two clubs based in the city of Genoa, Ginnastica San Pia d'Arenese and Società Andrea Doria. During the early days of Andrea Doria, the club's best league finishes came in the 1910-11 and 1912-13 Prima Categoria, while San Pia d'Arenese came very close to winning the Prima Categoria back in 1922. Then in 1927, the Italian fascist regime, in an effort to reduce strong rivalries in the same cities, imposed a merger between the two clubs to create La Dominante. The fans of both teams hated this merger, and just like anything the fascists ever try, it fails. Spectacularly. And judging from some of the comments I got in the Lazio video, I don't know, some people will get a little angry about that last statement, and all I'll say to that is, uh, f you, cry more, go outside. Fast forward to 1946 in the now Divisione Nazionale, Andrea Doria finished 9th and San Pia d'Arenese finished bottom in the northern region. This would actually be the only ever season of the Divisione Nazionale as the northern and southern teams would once again merge to make one league after it was deemed safe to again. In this case, it would make sense for Doria to be placed in Serie A while San Pia d'Arenese, who finished bottom, would be placed in Serie B. However, it was actually the other way around. This was all due to the failure of La Dominante. San Pia d'Arenese, or later AC Liguria, after another imposed merger, were hanging around Serie A and Serie B, while Andrea Doria was completely screwed over by the initial merger and were eventually dissolved in 1941. It wasn't until 1944 when they were refounded and then a year later given compensation. And because San Pia d'Arenese were in a less secure financial state than Andrea Doria, the two had a series of meetings and agreed to merging, this time on their own volition. And thus, Unione Caucho Sampdoria was born. The club would take both the white, red, and black of San Pia d'Arenese and the blue of Andrea Doria to create one of the most iconic shirts in Italian football today. Throughout the beginnings of UC Sampdoria, the club would hang around mid-table in Serie A. They earned their best finish to date in the 1960-61 season, finishing fourth, but then relegated just five seasons later. Sampdoria immediately returned to the top flight, hung around the mid-table for the next 10 seasons, and then once more relegated in the 1976-77 season. This time, however, Sampdoria would spend a lot more time in the second division. But fortunes quickly changed when oil tycoon Paolo Mantovani bought the club in 1979. After investing into a team and over the years bringing in the likes of goalkeeper Gianluca Pagliuca, centre-back Pietro Vecevo, defensive midfielder Toninho Serezzo, and an influx of attacking quality in Attilio Lombardo, Roberto Mancini, and Gianluca Viali, Sampdoria experienced their golden era. The team jumped back into Serie A in 1982 and in just three years won their first ever Coppa Italia. Sampdoria won the cup again in 1988 and once more in 1989 where they also also won the European Cup Winners' Cup. Then there was the infamous 1990-91 Serie A season. Napoli had just come off winning the league with Diego Maradona. Milan were reigning European champions. Inter were led by Italy's most decorated manager, Giovanni Trapattoni, and he had three 1990 World Cup winning stars under his wing. Then there was Juventus, who spent copious amounts of money to bring in multiple stars, one of which included Roberto Baggio. And in spite of it all, Sampdoria, a team who hadn't ever finished above fourth in Serie A, achieved the impossible possible and won the league. And it was none other than Mr. Inevitable himself, Gianluca Viali, who starred scoring 19 times. In the following year, Sampdoria reached the European Cup final and came agonizingly close to winning it all. This was the beginning of the end of an era as Sampdoria saw the departures of Toninho Serezzo, Gianluca Viali, and the manager behind this incredible golden era, Vujadin Boskov. One year later, things get even worse as Paolo Mantovani suddenly passes away. His son Enrico would then take over the club. For the next four years, more departures would be seen. However, Sampdoria did a really good job at maintaining their status as an elite club in Italy with their new signings. Those signings included Juan Sebastian Verón, Clarence Seedorf, and even Ruud Hullet. Led by Sven Goran Eriksson, Sampdoria won another Coppa Italia in 1994 and reached the semis of the Cup Winners' Cup the following year. Unfortunately, this new wave of success didn't last very long as Sampdoria relegated in 1999 and were on the verge of bankruptcy in 2002. So quick note, I'm not really sure how real this story is, but I'm just going to put it into this video because it's pretty funny. In 2002, an entrepreneur linked to the Saudi royal family was willing to save Sampdoria from demise. Omer Ahmed Massoud was the name, 
and he was entirely made up. This person was made up by four culprits, including former Sampdoria player Giuseppe Dosena. Their goal was to acquire a massive stake in the club, use it for their benefit, and then drive it straight into the ground. Now, in the article, it said that these guys were indicted, but I couldn't find any other source to confirm this. Thankfully for Sampdoria, there was a real person who would end up buying the club, oil businessman Ricardo Garone. He may sound new, but the initial of his last name had been on Sampdoria's shirts throughout their golden era. But in just one season under new ownership, Sampdoria returned to Serie A in 2003. And for the next five seasons, the club would hang around the upper half of the table and occasionally qualify for the UEFA Cup, the modern day Europa League. Then in the 2008-09 season, Sampdoria acquired forwards Antonio Cassano from Real Madrid and Giampaolo Pazzini from Fiorentina. Under the leadership of manager Walter Mazzari, Sampdoria would just miss out on winning the Coppa Italia on penalties. Mazzari would then leave soon after. The very next season saw the appointment of Luigi Del Neri, and he'd help Sampdoria finish in a Champions League playoff spot. However, Del Neri left right after as well and signed with Juventus. In the 2010-11 campaign, Sampdoria lost their Champions League playoff tie, and to make things even worse, they relegated that same season. Sampdoria returned to Serie A once again in 2012, and that same year indirectly gave birth to one of the most iconic stories in modern football. The Blue Cercati, though, survived their first season back, but unfortunately during that same campaign, owner Ricardo Garone would pass away. His family would then take care of the club until June 2014, when film producer Massimo Ferreira would gain control. He also agreed to take on the 15 million euros of debt the club had accumulated up to this point. Ferreira's beginnings with Sampdoria looked very promising. In the 2014-15 season, the team had a solid core and were placed fifth by the beginning of January. However, Ferreira then decided to sell their best striker Manolo Gabbiadini to Napoli in the winter window. He then brought in Luis Muriel and a pass to his prime Eto, but all that did was mess with the team's flow and they finished seventh after going winless in nine of their last ten games. In that same campaign, Ferreira was making quite a few headlines off the pitch. And not for good reason. He made a comment regarding former Inter owner Massimo Moratti, who resigned after a disagreement with new owner Eric Torrio. Ferreira said, quote, I am very sad for him. I had told him, kick out that Filipino. Torrio, by the way, is Indonesian. The Sampdoria owner later apologized, saying, quote, I didn't want to disrespect Mr. Torrio, the directors of Inter, or the people of the Philippines with whom I have a wonderful report. This statement is basically the PR version of I can't be racist, I have black friends. But then he was sentenced to a year and 10 months in prison for fraudulent bankruptcy of an airline company he owned. Then we had the 2015-16 season arrive, and it wasn't too far off what happened last season. It was only just worse. The team was 13th in January, and then Ferrero sold the other two dangerous attackers in Stefano Okaka and top scorer at the time Eder in January. He then loaned in former Sampdoria striker Fabio Quagliarella, and he only scored three goals. From there, Sampdoria barely survived, finishing just two points above the relegation zone in 15th. All the while, Massimo Ferrero had his assets seized by the Italian tax authorities due to suspected tax evasion in 2009. However, the club wasn't all doom and gloom. They brought in Marco Giampaolo, who gave fans some exciting high-tempo possession football. However, despite the football aesthetics being on point, the results never saw above a ninth place finish in three years. That was mainly due to the fact that Sampdoria were constantly selling young and promising talent every season. To name a few, there was Joaquin Correa in 2016, Milan Skriniar and Luis Muriel in 2017, Patrick Schick, Lucas Torreira, and Duvan Zapata in 2018, and Joachim Anderson in 2019. To explain why Sampdoria had to constantly sell their young promising talent, had to do with uh, a multitude of things. In 2016, Ferrero was arrested for the misappropriation of funds for his airline company. As a result, he was forced to step down as president of Sampdoria, which was met with glee by Ildoria Faithful. Unfortunately, he was still the owner of the club, and eventually he'd actually be reinstated as president. But this next part, gets even wilder. Ferrero was allegedly using Sampdoria's accounts for his own personal use and to replenish any of his other companies. But we can actually go even further into these accusations. Because in 2018, an order was issued to seize assets from Ferrero and five other members of his family for a total value of 2.6 million euros. A good amount of that sum came from the money collected from the sale of Pedro Obiang in 2015. However, he was later acquitted of this accusation in 2020. Now, if that wasn't already pissed 
pissing off Sampdoria supporters. Massimo had been very transparent about his love of Rome, often saying he'd love to buy Roma one day. Hell, he was already thinking about buying a lower division club one year into his ownership of Sampdoria. Well, all of this was just the beginning, because in December of 2021, Benedo was arrested for the fraudulent bankruptcy of his many companies created in the tourism, hotel, and cinematographic sectors. And he apparently faked a theft of a car to hide the accounting books of these different companies. He also used one of those companies' accounts to fraudulently buy a Ferrari 430 Spider model and multiple yachts. So because of his arrest, once again, he was removed as president of Sampdoria. But remember, he's still owner. Now, speaking of Sampdoria, how have they fared throughout all of this? Well, in 2019-20, Claudio Ranieri had to carry this club from the bottom of the table to safety. The Italian manager kept up that dilly-ding-dilly-dong energy into the next season, helping Sampdoria finish ninth. However, he announced his departure immediately after. Then in the 2021-22 season, Sampdoria lost 22 games and finished 15th. Now back up to date, and unfortunately, things have only gotten significantly worse. Sampdoria are currently bottom of the table 11 points from safety with 7 games remaining. A lot of that has to do with the young talent exports drying up, and Sampdoria barely spending much in the last 3 seasons because of how much their owner is in. In fact, this season, in two windows, Sampdoria have only spent 6 million euros in transfers. And this was after selling Mikael Damsgord for 15 million. And I do not mean this lightly whatsoever. The fans are pissed. I remember that 15 million euros in debt figure from 2014. Well, now it's reported to be 150 million. It's gotten so bad that wages are being sacrificed by players and coaching staff just so Sampdoria avoid a point deduction. And now relegation isn't even Sampdoria's biggest threats. It's bankruptcy. The club, Ferrero, and the Garone family who gave Ferrero such a massive stake in the club are now desperate to find someone to buy Sampdoria. But they had their chance years ago. In 2019, York Capital Management had interest and were planning to have the late Gianluca Vialli become chairman. However, no deal was ever agreed to. Then most recently in December 2022, the owners of Lille were interested in taking control of Sampdoria, but Ferrero just flat out ignored them. Time is still ticking though, and a buyer is needed. Badly. Because if a buyer isn't found, this club could cease to exist by the end of the season. And it's heartbreaking to see yet another Italian club with a rich history and a strong fan base is being actively f over by a person with a big ego trying to be the main character of his own production. We see this so often in Italian football that you wonder, is there even a tiny background check for any of these owners? Because hypothetically speaking, if you have enough money, you can take control of a 100 year old club and drive it straight into the ground. This has happened so many times before, I mean, another example, Piazza with Reggiana. I am frustrated and I'm freaking pissed off. But what do you guys think? Will Sampdoria survive? Will they find a buyer? Or will they fall into the graveyard of so many other Italian clubs in the past? Let me know. And of course, a massive shout out to all our patrons, including Janos Balash, Chris Damaseno, Miliwe 9 Aldipu, Alex Rod, Alta, Amin Suomez, Aresan, Carlos Anaya, Daniel Ortiz, Francisco Hernandez, Guy, Joao Carvalho, Jonah, Marco Fujimoto, Miguel Munoz, Return Fire, Rory Burns, Saw, Slider Kit, Sniffrix, The Motor Drive, Tomicus, Vanilla Mexican 17, Victor, Chris Visconti, Dominic Griffin, Emmett Shea, Lewis, Joao Paricio, Michael Nista, MX Weeb, Nish, Patrick Barley, Thomas, and Unbroken Persona. If you'd like to join the Patreon, there'll be a link down below and up in the annotations. You can follow my Twitter if you want, follow my Instagram if you like, follow my TikTok, trying to get to 20,000 there, and of course, you can follow my semi-active Twitch. But until then, I'll see you guys.